The musical introduction to the song Day and Night begins softly in the background as Rachel continues speaking calmly again to the audience. But it was just a dream after all, and this dream belongs to the day, not to the night. What the day ultimately preserved in this dream was not a consequence or an insight, but only the tormenting question, why did I not actually kill him? I do not know what in actual life keeps me from acting that way, or rather, I know precisely, though I do not know how to name it. What's the use of day's constant gratitude for life's being understandable if the night provides an endless panorama of images, a vast web of The story of the heart of the world and the spring. There is a mountain, and on that mountain there stands a rock. The spring gushes forth from that rock. Now everything has a heart, and the world as a whole has a heart. The heart of the world is a complete form with face, hands, and feet. And even the toenail of that heart is more heart-like than any other heart. The mountain and the spring stand at one end of the world, the heart is at the other. The heart stands facing the spring, yearning to draw near to it. It is filled with wild yearning and constantly cries out in its longing to approach the spring. The spring, too, longs for the heart. Now, if the heart is filled with so great a desire to draw near the spring, why does it not simply do so? And as soon as it begins to move towards the mountain, the mountaintop, where the spring emerges, it disappears from view. The light of the heart flows from that spring. So if it were to allow the spring to vanish from its sight, it would die. If the heart were to die, God forbid, the entire world would be destroyed. For the heart of the world is the life of all things. How could the world exist without a heart? For this reason, the heart can never approach the spring, but stands opposite, looks at it, and longs. What use is it to be brave and taciturn to deny the ultimate burden and profoundest unhappiness? Too proud to let even oneself share the secret. If the night reveals all, If the night refuses to keep silent, refuses to fulfill its function, and provide a dark and lulling background for into life's ground and native soil. Rachel once again speaks directly to the audience. I dreamed that everyone had found the ideal. Then I recognized that this ideal was a living person who could not restrain his laughter. 
awake in my dream, I announced to this person, My dear sir, it is absolutely outrageous that you are so joyous today. Will you ever stop laughing? Whereupon he put his arms around me and invited me to dance. Everyone else stepped back, but that did not bother us in the least. We just danced and danced and danced. Scene 19, Epilogue. Rachel comes out onto the apron, downstage right corner as in scene 1. Once again in her boudoir, she sits and contemplates how the events of her life have unfolded. She speaks directly to the audience. What a history! A fugitive from Egypt and Palestine, and here I find your help, love, and care. The sublime rapture I think back to these my origins and this whole web of destiny, in which the oldest memories of the human race are connected with the latest circumstances and the greatest distances of time and space are bridged. What for such a long period of my life was my greatest shame, my bitterest suffering and misfortune, were I born a Jewess, I would not now have missed at any price. The actress playing Rachel now looks over the character she has been playing. She stands and shares her reflections with the audience. The emotional and vocal tone should be clearly different from that of the character Rachel. Rachel was glad she had been born a Jew, but what those writers who have tried to make her finally Jewish have usually neglected is the end of the same passage in her writings. In 1814, when she was 43 years of age, Rachel Levine was baptized, changed her name, and married not the rich German Protestant Count Karl Gustav von Finkenstein, who had broken off the engagement upon the objections of his family, but the poor German Protestant Count August von Enz Barnhagen, who with no small amount of difficulty managed to make a living as a minor official of the Prussian bureaucracy. At age 63, tearful and near death, Rachel, or rather the Countess Antonie Friedrike von Inz of Arnhagen, wrote to her husband, 
The following letter is spoken as the character Rachel to an image of her husband, August, projected in space not far from her eyes. Dear August, my heart is refreshed in its innermost depths. I have thought of Jesus and cried over his passion. I have felt for the first time so felt it, that he is my brother. And Mary, how she suffered. She saw her beloved son suffer, but did not succumb. She stood at the cross. That I could not have done. I would not have been that strong. Forgive me, God. I confess how weak I am. Again, the actress looks over the character she has been playing. On March 7th, 1833, Rachel died and was laid to rest in a vault at Trinity Church near the Halesa Tod in Berlin. Thirty years later, she was buried there together with her husband, Barnagen. Rachel died childless and thus was fulfilled. Rachel did weep for her children, for they were not 